this is for the aficionados. If you want to go back, look at the paper. This is the algorithm we established, and I just wanted to emphasize the sequencing. We called de novo variants across the genome, also on the X chromosome. Again, most of the studies had not looked at that because they didn't have the high quality depth coverage. Uh, we also did hand annotation and um, went back and dug into those filtering levels to see if we could kind of cull out additional mutations, and we were able to, as I'll show you. And we looked, most importantly, at inherited autosomal changes, okay, because most studies have not done this. It's very difficult to call uh, inherited changes uh, in a trio kind of format. Spent lots of time uh, looking at rare deleterious so-called loss of function mutations, lots of medical annotations. Uh, and in particular, we did family analysis. Where we, we selected families where we had a lot of clinical data. Uh, and then we just really kind of worked hard looking for associations. Uh, again, I won't have a lot of time to go into this, but in the medical annotation, we compare to all the uh, known genes. Uh, we can identify new candidate genes uh, based on comparison to other data sets, and then ultimately some novel genes. So in um, sequencing of, um, in the sequencing of of these, these families, in 50% of the cases, we were able to find what we think is a mutation that either causes autism or one of the medical uh, complications that is, so, is associated with autism in that individual. Okay, so I'll just quickly run through the stats. Uh, mutations of interest were found in 16 families in which uh, five carried more than one presumed loss of function alteration. Deleterious mutations in 10 known autism genes in 10 families, eight candidate ASD genes in seven families, and four de novo novel genes were found in four families. Uh, I've highlighted with an asterisk those de novo mutations. Okay, and this is the preliminary look. We just started to look at the, uh, the intragenic intronic regions. I, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but the computer algorithms to scan for mutations in these long stretches of DNA uh, are still quite rudimentary, so we've been developing these. But the yield uh, by first pass analysis was quite high. Um, so you mentioned, so roughly 50% of the families who could find something of interest compared to the 20% uh, we would have using the more uh, older techniques. So why is that? So I mentioned that 13% of the exons are not captured on the standard uh, capture arrays. Six of the 56 clinically relevant variants we identified would not have been captured uh, when we did a comparison study. And the reason for that is the median coverage by whole genome uh, sequencing uh, is lower the exome, but we have much better coverage actually across that exome. So it allows us to capture uh, splice sites mutations in particular uh, uh, much more robustly. And in fact, those were some of the key mutations that we identified. Again, we found mutations on the X chromosome because we could look for them. Uh, and then ultimately this manual annotation where we kind of went and looked uh, manually to see if there were any mutations being filtered out uh, yielded another 5% or so of the mutations. So of these uh, 32, I should say, I said 33 before, we had spiked one family that we could kind of put through the whole process as a quality control. Um, of 16 of these families, we could identify de novo mutations in six uh, in ASD or ASD um, candidate genes and then inherited or X-linked autosomal alterations of 31%. So in, in half the families, we had something that met our criteria to actually convey information back to the families. And I'll just go through these three that are highlighted with the puzzle piece here. Oh, so why is this important? So the, in Toronto, for example, the average age of diagnosis of a child of autism is about 4.5 or 5 years old, and that varies from region to region. Um, to have optimal intervention, you need to start much earlier than that. In fact, you, you, ideally, you actually can, should start uh, at the same time of diagnosis. So this is a, an example of that chromosome 16P11.2 deletion that we identified uh, a few years back in this child who has uh, significant obesity also. Uh, and once we identified he had the deletion, we changed the anxiety uh, drug that he was on from Risperidone to uh, another brand, and that actually led to a massive reduction in his weight, and he started to behave much better. Uh, he improved uh, significantly. Um, many of these, these families go through a so-called odyssey of diagnosis. This kid went through eight different clinics at our hospital before he got a proper diagnosis. So the idea here is if we can have a genetic profile attached to the clinical phenotype, we might be able to have an impact uh, in a genomic medicine kind of way to uh, personalize his medical plan. So here's three examples. This was a, one of those families, a de novo nonsense mutation identified in the Capron 1 gene. Um, here's the, the index case shown here. 
this Caprin-1 gene encodes a protein that is very similar to the Fragile X mental retardation protein. You remember I, I mentioned Fragile X is one of these syndromic forms of autism. You see autism in 40% of Fragile X cases. Okay, so this is associated with autism. The gene product directly interacts with fMR1. It's been uh, involved in intellectual disability, so it's an excellent candidate gene. So in this instance, the de novo result may help to inform on family risk. Okay, so this was done retrospectively, uh, but had we known um, if there was questions about family counseling, uh, the likelihood of the second and third child would have returned back to population uh, average here, because it's a de novo mutation. The gene discovery may lead to a marker for early identification. The child could have been monitored much earlier and then could become actually a candidate for, for drug trials uh, targeting glutamate signaling because of the pathway involved. This is a second family, a rare missense mutation identified in, in the X-linked gene AFF2, which is called FMR2, and also a second gene, an autosomal potassium channel gene, KCNQ2. So here's the three-generation pedigree. Um, you can see the KCNQ2 mutation is inherited. Uh, the mother, the grandmother here does not have a phenotype. The, the, the father's uh, Asperger's syndrome, he has KCNQ2. And then the index case has, also has this mutation. Um, after we had published this, in fact, there's been a few other papers that have shown that this gene uh, is involved in autism. It previously was described to be involved in a benign uh, infantile form of epilepsy. So AFF2 is inherited from the mother. It's on the X chromosome, so she's unaffected. It's passed to the male. Uh, he has these two mutations, and we think they're probably both contributing to the severity of his autism. Okay, so the father Asperger's, this, this individual is uh, severely autistic. So AFF2 is a known uh, FMR2 gene. It's a known ASD risk gene. It's maternally inherited. KCNQ2 uh, causes benign neonatal epilepsy, which was seen in both of these cases, and now, depending on the mutation, seems to also be an autism gene. But what's really interesting in this family, of course, is the female sister, um, who we've gone back and re-phenotyped, and she actually has a very mild form of autism. Uh, but she's a carrier of this mutation, and when she goes through family planning, it would be very important for her family to know that uh, they have this in, in, their, in their family. Now also, because of the pathways involved, this, this child could also become a candidate for drugs that are being developed for targeting glutamate signaling. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but there's been some drugs developed for other purposes that have been uh, retooled now and are going through clinical trials uh, in the biotech sec sector. And these are targeting the, the Fragile X and also the um, MECP2, which is involved in Rett syndrome and autism, autistic individuals. And there's been some positive progress, at least in animal models, and I haven't seen the data on the human trials yet. But this is an example where you can use the mutation to guide the drug uh, towards the pathway that could be involved. And then the last example is a de novo loss of function mutation. Now, I, I emphasize de, de novo because as I show you, uh, this is a little bit more complicated. In the vasoactive inhibitor protein, VIP2, this gene has been discussed for a long time based on animal model studies and functional studies to be a candidate. And this is the first mutation actually found um, where we identified um, a, uh, a loss of function mutation in the index case. And when we went back and looked at the entire family, we could see that it was not in either, either biological parent, but in fact it was carried in the um, second born male sibling. And he had been collected actually before the time of typical age of diagnosis. So he was collected in this research study at age, I think it was two. When we went back and looked three or four years later, in fact, he's on the spectrum, but he has a, a less severe form of autism compared to his brother. VIP is known to be involved in circadian uh, rhythmicity based on knockout mouse studies, also social communication, uh, social de deficits. As I mentioned, mutation is also in the subclinical brother. Uh, and so this is explained most likely by gonadal mosaicism in one of the parents. So this would be an interesting example where the, the clinical genetics is a little bit more complicated because the, neither parent are a carrier. So uh, emphasizing again the, the need to really check families when you're doing these studies. So the sibling brother requires full assessment. We've now done that. The gonadal mosaic result helps to inform on risk in additional siblings. And there's also drugs for the uh, VIP antagonist drugs that could be used to, uh, to try to treat these children.
And I, I just summarized, this is a paper we have in review right now where we summarized uh, all of our uh, loss of function um, sequence level mutations and copy number variants, de novo damaging uh, mutations using a network-based approach. You've seen some of these slides earlier in other talks. Uh, and what's interesting is that of all of the, um, uh, um, these damaging mutations, we can essentially cluster all of them into three large networks, those including uh, what's called neuronal development and axon guidance, very large grouping shown in yellow. And the categories of mutations are shown here in this color scheme. Um, NAPK and other signaling, and then also chromatin modification and transcriptional regulation. And I, I find this cr pretty interesting. This is kind of a new area. It's starting to be published on, but our previous papers in 2010, we didn't pick up this because of the types of genes. But these types of genes and proteins could be sensors to the environment, so this might help explain uh, why there could be an environmental in influences in autism. So the remaining big questions I see in the field are, you know, why are there so many genes involved in ASD? There's been some estimates uh, by our consortium that have predicted out based on new mutation rates that perhaps there's anywhere up to 500 different genes involved. Uh, I think there's lots of targets. Uh, these rare variants are occurring all the time. There's selective pressures probably for uh, milder forms of this phenotype. But I think this will be a big question in the field. Are there any specific genes, uh, any genes specific to autism itself, or just general neurodevelopmental neuropsychiatric genes? I mentioned the Patch D1 story. So far, that's holding true, uh, that that could be an autism risk gene, but all the other ones are going cross disorder. Uh, it'll be important to turn it, determine population frequencies um, to really help enable proper clinical genetic interpretations. And then also, are all the autism risk genes and proteins somehow involved in regulating and maintaining neuronal synapse development and plasticity? I think we've really biased how we've gone in and do these, done these type of studies. We kind of keep comparing to the same old lists. Uh, certainly, there could be metabolic proteins involved and others, and I th we'll have to wait and see if this turns out to be the case. Uh, with that, I'll just leave up my credit slide. Uh, we have a large group. Uh, working here. We work closely with the families. Uh, each of the families we pretty much know by name that we're studying. We invite them in um, annually uh, to discuss our results, bef typically before we actually publish them, to get their in input of how they want to see the data presented. And then we've been funded uh, very generously by many agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for excellent presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, we will move to the last presentation of this session. Uh, the last speaker uh, is Professor Eric Hobson uh, from University of Texas uh, Southwestern Medical Center. The title of his presentation is The Molecules and the Mechanisms of Heart Development. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this meeting and thank all of you who have uh, stayed uh, to the end. What I'm going to do today is to talk to you about one short story on some recent work from our group which has focused on uh, mechanisms and new approaches for heart regeneration. So our group over the past uh, many years has used muscle cells, skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth muscle cells as, a mo as model systems for deciphering fundamental mechanisms of development and gene regulation and along the way we've uncovered many transcriptional regulatory circuits and important roles for microRNAs in the control of development and disease of these various muscle tissues. So today I'm going to talk to you just as I said about one uh, short story which focuses on uh, the heart and strategies for regenerating the heart in response to injury. So the heart is, as I think many of you appreciate, the most effective, really astonishing pump uh, ever invented. The heart is the first organ to form and function in the embryo and all subsequent events of life of the embryo and the adult required, require its second to second function. Just to put the, the power of this organ in perspective, if you keep in mind that the adult human heart weighs only 11 ounces and it pumps 8 tons of blood every single day, uh, the average heart, uh, human heart will beat 3 billion times in a lifetime without ever skipping a beat. In fact, it only skips one beat. That's the last beat. And the heart, though, despite this power, has a fundamental flaw, 
and that is that the heart is extremely complex and fragile and is susceptible to malfunction. And as a consequence, congenital heart disease seen in 1% of newborns is the most common human birth defect. And I think all of us are aware that adult heart disease is the number one cause of morbidity and mortality, exceeding all cancers uh, combined. So there is an enormous need to not only understand the fundamental biology of how the heart forms and functions, but also to, to design new strategies uh, for uh, heart repair. This slide summarizes the fundamental problem, and this is really the uh, number one uh, biomedical problem in the world today, and that is that the heart cannot regenerate or repair itself following injury, and the default response of the adult heart to injury is fibrosis. So this is a histological section through a mouse heart, but a human heart would look much the same. This is the chamber of the left ventricle, which pumps blood to the body. This is the right ventricle. In response to a coronary artery occlusion during a myocardial infarction, or in response to many other cardiac disorders, there's a massive and almost instantaneous loss of uh, myocytes from the left ventricle of the heart, which is the primary pumping chamber. And these are replaced by a fibrotic scar, you can see here. The scar serves as a barrier to regeneration. And it lacks any contractility. And as a result, the heart loses effectiveness. It dilates and ultimately progresses to heart failure and death. There have been thousands of patients treated over the past decade in the United States and Europe with stem cell therapy to try to enhance function to the failing human heart. And I think it's fair to say that all of those studies have failed. And so far, there's no evidence for injection of stem cells into the heart that can give rise to new cardiac muscle cells. And so I think it's time to really take a step back from this problem and think about ways to leverage our understanding of developmental mechanisms uh, as a strategy for generating new heart muscle. And so what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about some of the really new approaches and some of the ideas that we're uh, trying to apply to this problem. Now there's nothing inherent in the heart per se that is incompatible with, with regeneration. And in fact, some organisms have solved this problem. For example, zebrafish and many types of uh, amphibians, newts, salamanders can regenerate large portions of their heart following injury as they can also regenerate uh, organs. But clearly the adult mammalian heart, whether it be a mouse or a human, lacks any appreciable regenerative potential. So we decided to ask a question that surprisingly had not been asked previously, and that was, might there be a time in development of mammals when there could be the potential to regenerate portions of the heart? And if we could identify any uh, regenerative window, might we be able to amplify those mechanisms in the setting of adult uh, regeneration? And so we uh, initiated these studies in mice, and we began during the neonatal period and developed methods where we could injure the neonatal mouse heart and uh, monitor its response to injury. And when we did these experiments, we were stunned to find that the neonatal mouse heart can fully regenerate following injury. And this is a typical experiment. What we would do is perform an apical resection where one can amputate 20% or so of the, of the mass of the heart at the apex. And if one uh, then allows these animals, these animals will survive this surgery and they can be refostered with their mother. And if you monitor histologically what takes place in these hearts following injury, there's an immediate inflammatory response which has to seal the chamber of the left ventricle or, or the animals will exsanguinate. Then there's inflammatory response, there's proliferation of muscle cells across the organ, and ultimately there's complete disappearance of the wound and, and restoration of function. These animals, following massive injury to their hearts, can fully regenerate cardiac function and structure, and they then go on and live. They can live the same lifespan as a normal mouse, and they're completely uh, indistinguishable. So the amount of tissue mass that was removed in these initial amputation experiments, roughly 20% of the mass, is the same amount of tissue mass that's been used in studies from zebrafish and salamanders, which documented the regenerative potential of those organisms. Now, surgical amputation is obviously not the 
primary stimulus for heart uh, injury uh, in humans, and so we wanted to ask whether uh, inducing a massive myocardial infarction in a neonatal mouse could also be followed by a regenerative response. And so we developed methods for tying off the coronary arteries to the heart and inducing a myocardial infarction. And the way this was done uh, in these experiments w was we would induce an infarct by tying off the, the artery. And we began on day one after birth, and we'd look at the animals uh, 21 days later on day 22. And these are cut in cross-section in contrast to the previous slides, which were longitudinal. What you can see here is that if you induce a myocardial infarction at day one and you look 21 days later, there's no evidence for a myocardial infarction in these hearts, uh, indi indicating that they have fully regenerated all of the uh, ventricular myocytes following injury. If we delay the injury to day seven and induce an MI and then look 21 days later, we can see some, uh, quite a bit of evidence of regeneration, but there's also a, a prominent scar forming that you can see here. And if we allow these animals to go to 14 days or to adulthood, they exhibit the adult response to cardiac injury. That is that there's no regeneration and instead there's massive formation of scar, a blockade to contractility and dilation of the left ventricular chamber. So from these experiments and others, we've concluded that the ability of the mammalian heart to regenerate is impeded by the process of fibrosis and the fibrotic response becomes more robust with time as the regenerative response declines and ultimately by the adult stage fibrosis uh, occurs uh, maximally and regeneration uh, is completely prevented. Now we've gone on it, have characterized the, the cellular processes associated with the neonatal regenerative response and they are much the same as those seen in uh, more primitive organisms like zebrafish and amphibians. So the initial response is an inflammatory infiltration in the region of, of the lesion. There's activation of a layer of cells surrounding the heart known as the epicardium. I won't talk about this today, but this is an injury sensitive stem cell niche that's activated in response to injury and provides signals for regeneration. There's new blood vessel formation and there's a fascinating response that we're still trying to understand and that is that cardiac muscle cells across the organ from top to bottom are induced to proliferate when there's an injury at the apex and we're currently trying to understand if that's a mechanical or a biochemical signal that induces these responses. The, the culmination of these events is complete regeneration of the heart and each of these events is blocked uh, in, the adult, uh, in the adult heart. So just to look a bit deeper at some of these steps, we, here we've monitored the process of, of new blood vessel formation by casting. All right, let's uh, hope for the best here. All right, so here we've casted the uh, complete vasculature in the heart following injury. If we induce a coronary artery ligation right here, this, is, this entire region of the heart would die. This is the zone of regeneration. And what you can see is during the neonatal period, there's massive formation of new blood vessels, both from left to right, and left to left, and right to left. Now we've wanted to understand what is the cellular and molecular basis of new blood vessel formation, and we've investigated the inflammatory response. We noticed early on that macrophages infiltrated into the heart following injury, and so we've eliminated the macrophage population by injecting animals with liposomes impregnated with clodronate, which can be phagocytosed by the, the macrophages. So here again is a neonatal heart. We've induced a myocardial infarction. Look 22 days later, it's regenerated. There's just a trace of the infarct. If we eliminate the macrophage population, regeneration is completely abolished and instead we have scar formation. So macrophage infiltration during the inflammatory response is clearly critical for neonatal regeneration. We can look more closely at this, and that this may be a bit hard to see, but here's a, a regenerating heart in the infarct zone. You can see all these new blood vessels here stained for PCAM, seen here also in red. And if we eliminate the macrophage population, there is no new blood vessel formation, and instead there's simply a fibrotic scar devoid uh, of, of new blood vessels. So from these and other experiments, we now believe that the injury response to the neonatal heart leads to an innate immune response in which macrophages and other types of inflammatory cells infiltrate the injury 
and they release a number of cytokines, which I won't have time to talk about today, that we believe stimulate neoangiogenesis and probably survival of muscle cells, contributing to regeneration. In the adult heart, this step is blocked. There's a different uh, spectrum of macrophages that infiltrate the heart in a different constellation of cytokines released, which we think drives fibrosis. So these, again, are the, are the steps involved in neonatal heart regeneration. One of the other uh, important steps that I describe is that cardiac muscle cells are induced to proliferate across the organ, and very little is known about mechanisms that can drive proliferation of cardiac muscle cells. Norbert Paramon described an ancient signaling system that controls cell proliferation in organisms ranging from fruit flies to mammals. This is known as the HIPPO pathway, which is comprised of a series of kinases and adapter proteins that transmit growth signals from the cytoplasm and the exterior of the cell to the nucleus. The terminal uh, transcription factor in this pathway is a, a transcription factor called YAP in mammals and Yorkie in fruit flies. And so we tested whether this pathway might be involved in the control of cardiomyocyte proliferation. If we elevate the expression just of this transcription factor at the end of the HIPPO pathway in the embryonic heart, shown here in a transgenic mouse, you can see that simply expressing activated YAP is sufficient to drive the production of excessive cardiac muscle cells here compared to a control. So we then used a genetic strategy where we could selectively activate, this is going to get old real fast here. It's, all right. Um, let's try again. We selectively activated YAP in the adult heart. and induced a myocardial infarction. In a normal heart, if you induce an MI, you have fibrosis and dilation with, and this is sequential sections across the heart. In animals that have uh, expression of activated YAP in their heart, they're resistant to uh, this uh, injury. They have excessive proliferation and survival, and you can see here they retain heart muscle following injury. If we measure the size of the fibrotic scar following injury, in wild type compared to transgenic mice, you can see that the fibrotic scar is diminished when we simply activate this, this terminal step in the, the HIPPO pathway. And this is a bit complicated, but if you measure cardiac contractility, in normal mice, when you induce a myocardial infarction, contractility drops precipitously, whereas in animals with activated YAP at the end of the HIPPO pathway, they maintain cardiac contractility due to uh, proliferation. So what I've told you so far is that uh, one, that there are, are several events that enable the neonatal heart to uh, regenerate, and those steps are blocked or diminished in the adult heart. And so we're currently trying to manipulate those pathways using microRNAs, regenerative genes, or regenerative molecules. Now, in the last few minutes of the talk, I'd like to tell you about a complementary strategy, and that is to reprogram the fate fibroblasts, which would otherwise form a scar, into new cardiac uh, muscle cells. Now, while we're most familiar with cardiac muscle cells as the primary cell type of the heart, it turns out that roughly half of the cells of the heart are not cardiac muscle cells, but are instead fibroblasts, which serve as interstitial cells, uh, linking uh, cardiac muscle cells and other cell types, and also serving as uh, signaling centers in the heart. Now, in response to injury, when myocytes are lost, as I've described, the fibroblast population becomes activated and forms the fibrotic scar, which at least in part serves as a barrier to regeneration. And so we've wondered whether we might be able to divert these scar-forming fibroblasts into the formation of new heart muscle cells. Now, over the past 15 years or so, our group and others have deciphered the core components of a gene regulatory network that drive the formation of, of the heart in organisms ranging from fruit flies to mammals. And at the center of this network of cardiogenic genes are five or so 
transcription factors schematized here. And we know from mutations and gain-of-function experiments of these transcription factors in many organisms that they're sufficient and in many cases, uh, they're necessary and in many cases sufficient to drive the cardiac program. And so we've asked whether introducing any combinations of these or other factors into cardiac fibroblasts could uh, promote their conversion into a cardiac fate. Now to address that qu question, we first established a model system in which we generated transgenic mice that harbored in their genomes a reporter gene for green fluorescent protein linked to the DNA sequences for the alpha myosin heavy chain gene, alpha MHC, which is expressed only in, in the heart and not in any other cell types. We can isolate fibroblasts from the tail tip of these mice, put them in culture, and then infect them with viruses encoding various types of transcription factors, chromatin remodeling enzymes, or, or other molecules, and ask, can we find any that can activate the expression of the GFP reporter? And suffice to say that from a, an extensive uh, iterative screen of many transcription factors, drugs, microRNAs, et cetera, we ultimately settled upon a combination of four transcription factors, shown here. You can just remember them as GHMT. These are conserved in organisms from fruit flies to humans and are dedicated to cardiac gene regulation in those organisms. And if these four factors are engineered into a virus and put into fibroblasts, they, could, they initially could switch on the GFP reporter, and that's how uh, they were identified in the screen. Without getting into too much detail, this is what a typical assay would look like. If one isolates fibroblasts from the tail tip of these transgenic mice and separates them by flow cytometry, they express zero alpha MHC GFP, and they express zero cardiac troponin T, a, a cardiac-specific uh, structural protein. If we infect them with GHMT, you can now see that these cells have migrated to these positive channels and are expressed in quite robust levels of these cardiac markers. And this is what a typical fibroblast would look like after infection with GHMT. Here it's activated, GH, it's activated uh, the GFP marker and it's activated cardiac troponin T. This shows the quantification. There's no background in this assay. So tail tip fibroblasts from mice do not express these markers at all. And when they're expressed, when they're infected with GHMT, they upregulate these markers quite appreciably, but still there's much room for improvement. So we see roughly 20% of the cells become positive for these markers. This is what the cells look like. So these would be fibroblasts that have been transduced with the GHMT viruses in vitro. Initially, when stained in this case for alpha actinin, which is a cardiac structural gene, they show a diffuse distribution. They don't all have heart-shaped nuclei, but that was a good one. Uh, so they have diffuse cardiac protein expression in their cytoplasms, but with time and culture, the, their cytoplasms begin to organize, and ultimately, by about four weeks in culture, they show the classical striated sarcomeric appearance of adult cardiac myocytes, and a subset of these, a small subset, uh, will uh, beat spontaneously uh, in culture. So based on, on these experiments and other work done by others, including uh, Deepak Srivastava and many other groups, we were confident that we knew, knew at least the, the primitive recipe of transcription factors that was sufficient to reprogram a fibroblast into a cardiac fate. And so we wanted to go ahead and do the ultimate experiment and ask, could we introduce these cardiogenic transcription factors into the heart in vivo and divert fibroblasts from the formation of a scar. Now, this is a complicated experiment, and it requires precise lineage markers so that one can trace the fate of a fibroblast uh, in vivo. When we began these studies, the, the best known fibroblast marker was a protein called fibroblast-specific protein, FSP1, uh, drive, that promoter driving a Cree recombinase. You can cross that into a mouse line that has a, a floxed Rosa lac Z, so this Cree will activate lac Z and turn fibroblasts blue. We then induce a myocardial infarction by tying off the left ascending coronary artery, left anterior descending coronary artery, and we inject with the retroviruses encoding GHMT. Now, the viruses that we use for these experiments infect only proliferating cells, not postmitotic cells, so they'll infect the fibroblast population, but they won't infect. Uh, cardiac myocytes. 
And the question is, can any of these labeled fibroblasts uh, become uh, blue cardiomyocytes? This is what a typical experiment looks like. This particular transgene combination is not as expressed above background levels in normal, unstimulated, stressed fibroblasts. So in a cross-section, you see little or no staining. If one induces a myocardial infarction and cuts the heart in cross-section, you can see all these fibroblasts forming the scar have activated this fibroblast-specific marker, so they're highly marked. There's no marking of cardiomyocytes with this marker. If you then inject into regions surrounding the infarct, the virus encoding GHMT in wait roughly three weeks, what one sees is clusters of intensely blue labeled cells, which we believe arose from fibroblasts that were reprogrammed towards a cardiac fate by the GHMT viruses. At high magnification, this is what a typical uh, heart would look like following this in vivo reprogramming assay. So here's two cardiomyocytes, A and B. A is obviously labeled with LAC-Z from the fibroblast LAC-Z marker, so we believe it came from the reprogramming process. B is unlabeled, so we believe that's a nascent pre-existing cardiomyocyte. They're both stained in red with cardiac troponin T, a heart-specific marker, and they're connected by Connexin uh, 43, shown here, which is a gap junctional protein expressed specifically in the heart, suggesting that these, these two uh, myocytes have connected properly. Now here's two small blue myocytes. We believe those both came from reprogrammed fibroblasts because they're labeled with LAC-Z, and they're also connected by Connexin 43. I won't go into the details, but suffice it to say, you can dissociate these various cells and, cult and culture them in vitro. Here's an unlabeled cardiomyocyte, and, which is presumably a pre-existing one. It exhibits uh, calcium transients and contractility with frequency uh, characteristic of cardiomyocytes. Here are two myocytes that can be labeled with a cell permeable dye for beta-galactosidase, so we believe they were reprogrammed and they also show calcium transients and cardiac contractility. So we believe that these in vivo reprogrammed fibroblasts can adopt properties of native cardiomyocytes. Now again, in, in these sorts of experiments, your ability to interpret them is only as good as your lineage markers, and so we wanted to generate an independent lineage marker for the fibroblast population. And so here we generate a second marker by inserting into the locus through homologous recombination a, a cre recombin an inducible cre recombinase gene into this locus called TCF21, which is the name of the gene is not particularly important. But we could label then these fibroblasts within the heart in vivo by crossing them to a tomato reporter. So all the fibroblasts turn red. So here you can see a typical histological section, the green striated myocytes are obvious and nestled amongst them are these red uh, cardiac fibroblasts. And so once again, we can activate tomato in these fibroblasts, induce a myocardial infarction in this heart, inject GHMT, and ask, can we find any tomato-positive cardiomyocytes? This is what an experiment looks like. So we've dissociated cardiomyocytes from these hearts uh, following reprogramming and put them in culture. So here you can see two unlabeled cardiomyocytes in the background, and here's an intensely tomato-positive cardiac myocyte. We call these induced cardiac-like myocytes, ICLMs. You can do patch clamping on, this is a tomato-positive one, so presumably it came from a fibroblast, and here's a native endogenous myocyte, and they both have action potentials that uh, look uh, quite similar. So this is uh, the last experiment I'm going to show you, that is to test whether in vivo reprogramming of fibroblasts using these cardiogenic transcription factors can enhance cardiac function. Now in these experiments, for those of you who aren't familiar with these approaches, cardiac function is measured by ejection fraction. This is the fraction of the volume of the blood in the heart that's expelled with each contraction. So in a normal mouse heart, unoperated, 70% of the blood would be expelled each time the heart contracts. And if you induce a myocardial infarction by tying off the coronary artery here, the heart loses uh, contractility due to myocyte loss, and that drops to about 25%, and it stays at that level persistently. 
If we inject these hearts with virus encoding GHMT, what we've seen is that there's a dramatic improvement of cardiac function. They don't get back to normal, and I don't think we would expect them to do so, but they show remarkable improvement in cardiac contractility here at six weeks, 12 weeks, and we've now carried these animals out for over a year, and this is a permanent improvement of cardiac function following uh, reprogramming in vivo with these uh, cardiogenic viruses. Now, these experiments are clearly interesting. They're consistent with the in vitro data that we've generated on the reprogramming process, but they also raise, I think, some very important questions that we're currently wrestling with. The magnitude of functional improvement by in vivo reprogramming is much more dramatic than we would expect based on the number of cardiomyocytes that we can see to be reprogrammed from fibroblasts. And we're currently trying to understand what is the, the basis for this disparity. It could be that the reprogramming process is more efficient in vivo than we're able to visualize. We can only visualize those cells for which we can mark them with uh, these lineage tracers and maybe GHMT is reprogramming other cell types in the heart towards cardiomyocytes. But it's also possible that these cardiogenic viruses are acting through other mechanisms to enhance cardiac function. They may be themselves blocking fibrosis by inhibiting proliferation of fibroblasts. We know they're, induced, they're enhancing cardiac survival, and perhaps we know angiogenesis is robustly induced by these factors, and perhaps they're doing that more direct through some direct mechanism, and we're currently trying to sort that out. So lastly, what I've told you then today is that the heart is notoriously refractory to regeneration, and there is an enormous need to understand this process as a strategy for possible new approaches for heart repair. What I've told you is that we believe that there are at least three complex processes that are at play that dictate whether a neonatal heart can regenerate or an adult heart cannot regenerate, and those are the processes of fibrosis, inflammation, and regeneration based on cell proliferation. We think that we are beginning to get a foothold on some of these processes. I think we know some of the molecules, some of the genes, and some of the mechanisms involved, at least in idealized settings. And using that knowledge, we're currently identifying microRNAs, new drugs, and regenerative molecules that can augment uh, the types of regenerative strategies that I've described to you today. And lastly, let me just close by uh, acknowledging the people that have done this work. All the work I talked to you about on uh, the role of macrophages in regeneration was carried out by a postdoc in our lab, Aaron Aurora. Gua Huang, who's a new faculty member at UCSF, has worked on the role of the epicardium in heart regeneration. And these, these are postdocs who have all taken new jobs at these institutions, and they contributed to all the other work that I described today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Olsen. Uh, I think this will conclude uh, the last session of uh, today's meeting, and uh, I will hand this over to you. Uh, do you think we have? Okay, so, um, Dr. Olsen, um, since then we will have a few minutes for questions. I would like to invite all the speakers uh, for the last session. Professor 